Hello and welcome, one and all. This is Mick the Otter. I hope today's a great day for each and every one of you. Either way, here's an otter. Today I wanted to talk about an actual god. Or, should I say, demigod. Technically, both are true. It just depends on when you look at the protagonist in the story. His name is Heracles. The etymology of his name meaning glory of Hera. Now, you may be thinking, that sounds like Hercules. A much more recognizable name, probably one you're very familiar with. Well, these two names refer to the same deity. Rome just copied Greece's homework and had a better marketing strategy. The only notable differences between him and her, Achilles, are the latter doesn't have any engaging etymology in his name, very slight variations in the Roman version of the story, and oh yeah, their fathers are Zeus and Jupiter, respectively. Now that that distinction has been made, enough about Rome more about Greece. Let's talk Heracles. Seed into another fair maiden at the time, by the name of Alcmene. As if Zeus didn't have enough uncool points, he shapeshifted into Alcmene's husband to then butta-bang butta-bang her. Yes, her husband. Now honestly, she could have got a lot worse from him, including, but not limited to, a bull, a swan, and straight up sunlight, don't ask. Now, Alcmene's husband, Amphitryon, gets home from work and decides he wants a piece that same day. Alcmene is left mighty thirsty after Zeus's god c so they get frisky. Fast forward a little bit and Alcmene gives birth to not one, but two sons. Iphicles and Heracles. They were half-brothers, and as Iphicles is obviously not the son of Zeus, and hardly shows up at all outside the brothers raising in Thebes, is not really important to the story. Sorry, bud. The actual son of Zeus out of these two, Heracles, is already a point of bitter hatred for Hera, ironically enough, because to her, Hercules' whole existence is representation of Zeus's habit of infidelity. Now, we're all capable of hating somebody, but Hera's hate is just a little bit different. And here's an example of that, right? One night, baby Heracles is snoozing in his crib, snug as a buck, and middle of the night, about 3 a.m., two of Hera's attack snakes slither up into said crib and get ready to end him. Now, it would have been a good plan, but I think she forgot he is still the son of Zeus, so Heracles wakes up and strangles them effortlessly. Now, to kind of make up for this incident and reconcile the relationship as a whole, because while he was still okay, it still happened, Heracles' half-sister Athena drops him off at Hera's house to offer him to be breastfed by her, because to her, that was kind of a really special thing. Now, make note of what I just said. Heracles, as an infant, strangled two fully grown venomous snakes. Okay, that's really not abnormal in the grand scheme of Greek mythology, but it's still impressive. He is strong AF, given that he is the son of Zeus. And Hera, breastfeeding him her super special boob milk. She unwittingly amped his strength by 3x at least. Now, once baby Heracles had his absolutely gluttonous fill, he was dropped off back at home with Alcamene, mortal bro, and real dad. Now yeah, the whole point of Heracles breastfeeding from Hera was to be a symbolic gesture, an effort to forge a bond with one another, to end the animosity Hera felt on him just because he was breathing. But really, what did that matter when she continued to harbor enmity toward him, she developed a one-of-a-kind curse just for him, and would ultimately be the reason for his agonies, trials, and challenges in life, so, why not enjoy that good, good Olympian fair life while you can? Everything following into his young adult life is pretty unmemorable and relatively ordinary for a Greek upbringing, until one day he met a fair maiden by the name of Megara. Meg was the daughter of King Creon of Thebes. They fell head over heels for each other, Heracles got King Creon's blessing after tossing the invading Menaeans around, and Bob's your uncle, now they're married. They procreate and give birth to a couple of kids, start to live that white picket fence life, probably get a dog at some point, until one tragic fateful day. We'll call that day the inciting incident, 
because every story has one. Now, on the day of the inciting incident, Pericles, Megara, the kids, and the pooch are all chilling out playing Monopoly. The dog buys Boardwalk, and Heracles goes berserk. He kills the dog first, then ends his wife and progeny. At first glance, it looks like Heracles got pissed because he lost a game of Monopoly, but it was really the super specific curse Hera made for Heracles that I mentioned earlier, created with the intention to completely ruin his life. This curse, so originally dubbed the Curse of Hera, or Curse of Madness even, a much more fitting name in my opinion, inflicted such an uncontrollable rage and insanity that while Heracles was afflicted, he pretty much wasn't even conscious anymore. He would just rip and tear until it was done, and then snap back to reality when Hera flipped the switch. When Heracles did come to and realize what he had done, he was understandably distraught, grief-stricken, and maidenless. He sought out the Oracle of Delphi, who, acting as the practical mouthpiece for Apollo, advised Heracles to serve King Eurystheus for ten years. In this time frame, he would carry out a set of labors delegated by the king, after which Heracles would be absolved of his sins and redeemed. That slew of events led to what is famously known as the Twelve Labors of Heracles. Fun fact, there were originally only ten labors, but two of the original ten were discredited from Heracles' progress because the king is a dick, and two more were tacked on. All the same, let's talk about these twelve labors, starting with numero uno, the slaying of the Nemean lion. What made the Nemean lion so special, aside from being a radiant furball of gold, was its hide. Resisted any threat by mortal means, it could not be ripped, torn, or damaged by weapons made by man or woman at all. It didn't take Heracles long to figure this out, and his resourcefulness took him to strangling the beast instead. After he squeezed the life out of this lion, he used the beast's own claws to skin it. And that's how he got the pelt of the Nemean lion. His second trial was to slay an even meaner monster, the Lernaean Hydra. I'm pretty sure everyone here knows what a Hydra is, but if you don't, all you have to know is it's big, venomous, got a lot of heads, and it regenerates. Heracles realized that, so he did what any sensible person would do, and called his nephew Iolus' Greek landline and said, you, me, Hydra. Iolus comes along, and when they start boxing the Hydra, it starts doing its special quirk where it regenerates two heads for each one lopped off. Iolus uses his big brain to cauterize each stump that Heracles would leave, and this strat actually worked. The Hydra was slain. And before they turned in their quest to King Eurystheus, Heracles took a handful of arrows and coated them in the Hydra's venom. This will come in handy later. They go back to the quest hub, turn in the Lernaean Hydra quest for rewards, and King Eurystheus rejects it. As a twist of events, he discredits Heracles' accomplishment of this labor, for the reason being that he received external help. To compensate for what he saw as a failed labor, he tacked another one on. Don't get it twisted, though. King Eurystheus was not at all happy when he realized Heracles could kill these two creatures. Following the Hydra, he steered clear of any more Slay the Monster type missions. Heracles' third labor was to capture the Golden Hind of Artemis. For us southerners out here, that just means Golden Deer. This was one of multiple capture missions Heracles would be assigned to complete, and while this one wasn't especially hard to accomplish, there was definitely an ulterior motive behind this assignment. King Eurystheus sat on his throne of doom and twirled his villain mustache for this one. He figured if Artemis caught Heracles harassing her sacred animal, it would incur her wrath. He did not take into account that Heracles would ask her nicely and she'd be totally cool with it. He brings the deer back to Eurystheus and then it zips back to Artemis, no problem. The fourth labor is another capture mission, except the target in question is the Aramathian boar. This boar was bigger and badder than the Golden Hind of Artemis, and would surely prove to be a bigger threat. One that would trump even Heracles and leave Eurystheus and Hera laughing at the hero's failure. Nope, not at all. He trots over to Mount Erymanthos, dips the boar into the snow to slow it down enough for him to pick up, and then he fireman carries it home. There are a few different versions to this tale, like with all of them, some of which involve drunk centaurs and Chiron helping out our protagonist by telling him the snow will slow down the boar just enough 
to capture him. At the same time, Heracles did it, and King Eurystheus got scared shitless. Heracles came home with that thing, and he got the king jumping into a pot, screaming at him to take it back. With four under the belt, it was time for the fifth labor, cleaning out the Augean stables. Yup, he now had to clean the mountainous piles of shit left by King Augeus' cattle. When Heracles got over there, he and Augeus made a deal, where Heracles would leave with some of the cattle for doing this. When they shook hands, Heracles said bet and ran off for a few minutes. Augeus stood there utterly confused for that time, and then a raging flash flood swept through and cleared out the stables of all filth. See, Heracles wasn't about to get in there and scrub a dub the shit off the wall, no. He diverted two rivers to flow through the stables. Instead of the months that King Eurystheus, King Augeus, and Hera thought it would take, it only took one day. Being the quivering beta that Augeus is, he reneged on the deal. To top it all off, this labor was also discredited because, and I paraphrase, Heracles did it for pay. He didn't even get paid though, so rightfully, royally pissed as he was, he stomped back over to King Augeus, Sparta kicked him off his throne, and plopped Augeus' son on the royal chair. Heracles left with the cattle he was promised because him and his son were cool like that. Totally not because this kid just watched his dad get tossed like Caesar salad. Halfway there now at six, Heracles' next task was to scare away the Stymphalian birds from the swamp they lived in. Why? Good question. I don't even know. This also had Athena going, this is BS, and she slid a pair of bronze clappers under the table to Heracles. Eurystheus thought he had a huge IQ play by sending Heracles after man-eating birds, but I think he forgot everything but the deer and shit stains has had people on their menus anyway. Still, Heracles walked up and started rattling this clapper like he was taking Circe through King's Landing. This scared the birds into the air, and Heracles started shooting them down. Those that he didn't shoot down had the good sense to fly away forever. The seventh labor is to capture the Cretan bull. Fun fact, listen close. The Cretan bull is famous for being the progenitor of all minotaurs. So this raises two very concerning possibilities. Either some girl got way too lost and Mr. Concrete capitalized on his opportunities, or some girl got way too curious and I'll leave it at that. I'm not sure I even want to delve into that one. But I probably will at some point, and when I do, everyone will suffer with me because it'll be a video. Anyway, back on topic. Heracles went next door and asked King Minos if he could borrow the Cretan bull. King Minos was all for it, especially since the bull has done nothing but cause problems anyway. King Eurystheus is shocked as usual when he sees Heracles triumphantly return, and as Eurystheus is climbing back into his hiding pot, the Cretan bull breaks loose and tears up their city for a little bit until he goes back home. Labor number eight, capture the Mares of Diomedes. King Eurystheus by this point was getting fed up with the amount of protagonist gumption that Heracles kept demonstrating because this labor wasn't about scaring a few man-eating birds off. It was to capture and bring back a herd of man-eating horses from another kingdom. That kingdom being Thrace, where King Diomedes ruled. You see, Heracles' strat for this one was to solid snake his way into the stables and just walk the horses out. It almost worked too, he got in and subdued the guards keeping watch. King Diomedes just chose the sign of all knights to go for a walk and spotted the suspiciously moving crate. The two of them duke it out and King Diomedes gets his ass handed to him. Heracles hits the stage fatality with this one and tosses the king into the pen to be eaten by his own horses. After the mares ate their master, they became docile and not at all flesh hungry. So Heracles walked them back home, all according to plan. The ninth flavor of Heracles King Eurystheus thought, well if he won't die by man-eating monsters or drown in a mountain of shit, maybe he can die by snoo snoo. So he sent Heracles to meet up with the Amazons and snatch the girdle of Hippolyta. He set sail with a couple of his Greek homies when Eurystheus wasn't looking and meets his tender date. They get to Hippolyta's house and chat it up first, and <laughs> within five minutes the queen of the Amazons really just says, yeah you can have my belt Mr. Handsome. Hera really did not like this and intervenes herself. She takes the Olympic elevator down to the island while dressed up as an Amazon so she can spread rumors about Heracles, the most prominent one being that he intends to kidnap their queen. Now, don't ask me, but everyone instantly believes this random Amazonian and goes to arms against Heracles. He's forced to kill Hippolyta and take the girdle and then sells away. For those wondering about the Greek homies that went with him, their fates were death by snoo snoo. We are in double digits now with the 10th labor of Heracles. 
Retrieving the Cattle of the Monster Garion. Garion is a giant with three upper bodies attached to his waist. Not that it even really mattered, Heracles was still going to run his pockets. But first, he had to take a long journey just to get there. On this long journey, he had to cross the vast Libyan desert. And he made it a good chunk of the way before getting so agitated at the heat that he shot an arrow at the sun. The Titan Helios, the one in charge of the sun, was just chilling up in the sky and thought this gesture was more cute than insulting, so he swooped down to give Heracles a lift. Heracles is then dropped off at Erythia, where he had to kill a few people and a two-headed dog named Orthros. When Garion found out his giant's best friend was killed, he was none too happy and fought Heracles. Heracles wasn't having it and ran his pockets. He rounded up the red cattle and set off on another arduous journey. Altogether, by the time he finally got back to King Eurystheus, it had been an easy year and a half or so. The Eleventh Labor of Heracles is a lot less taxing as a matter of fact. Go pick some apples. The catch here is those apples are solid gold and grant immortality to those that eat them. Unbeknownst to Heracles, those apples were hidden in the far northern edge of the world in the Garden of the Hesperides. That garden was also under constant watch by the dragon Ladon, the Hesperides themselves who were the daughters of Atlas, and to top it all off, Atlas himself. It's just chilling up there as well. Now, first things first, Heracles had to find out where the garden even was. So he found out where Nereus lived on the other side of present-day Asia and got it out of him the old-fashioned way. Among his many side quests on this journey, he also made it up to the mountain that Prometheus was chained to and pasted the eagle tormenting him for the past 30 years. After Heracles freed him, Prometheus gave him the tip to make Atlas pick the apples for him, so Heracles wouldn't have to fight the dragon or deal with the daughters of Atlas, the nymphs. Our protagonist did just that. He asked Atlas for his aid, and in return, Heracles would hold the sky until Atlas was done picking the apples from the tree. Atlas had an unbelievable stroke of brilliance and told Heracles, you know what, you can keep the sky. I don't want it. And then all of that unbelievable brilliance was flushed down the drain when he bought Heracles' lie of, yeah, bro, totally, just let me get some pads for my shoulders so it can actually do this. Heracles handed the sky back to Atlas, took the apples, and dipped. He got them back to King Eurystheus just fine, but before he could actually hand them over, his half-sister Athena paid another visit to him and delivered the apples back to the garden because mortals aren't allowed to have them. Still, a labor done is a labor done. Finally, the twelfth and final labor of Heracles is to go to Hades and come back with Cerberus, the three-headed guard dog of the underworld. Which at first seems like the ultimate F you, but then you realize it's almost the same as Artemis's golden deer, except with the underworld's goodest pupper instead. See, Heracles traipses down below and talks to his good, often villainized Uncle Hades. He asks if he could borrow Cerberus for a few minutes, and Hades is fairly agreeable. His only stipulation is Heracles can't use any weapons to do so. Heracles finds Cerberus, and they wrestle. Heracles won that without much effort, and carried the three-headed hound back up to King Eurystheus. King Eurystheus, upon seeing this, is mortally terrified, and orders Heracles to take Cerberus back to the underworld. Heracles does this, and is then freed from his servitude, and redeemed for his sins. This is not the end of Heracles' story by any means, far from it. Once he is free, he has several more adventures, all full of their own awesome tales. For now, let's fast forward a little to the most important one. He encountered another fair maiden, who was the daughter of a king, much like Megara. Deianira, the daughter of King Oneus of Caledon, was who Heracles set his eyes on. The two married and loved each other. And you would think Heracles would settle down after getting married again and live that white picket fence life, but nope. He carries on doing what he does, with her at his side. One day, a random centaur by the name of Nessus sees this. He gallops up and decides he wants a piece, so he snatches her up. And before the centaur could escape, Heracles shot him with one of his Hydra Venom arrows from earlier. 
The centaur, in his dying breaths, convinced Deanira that his blood would work as a love charm to prevent Heracles' potential infidelity in the future. Deanira bottled some of the centaur's blood, and the duo went on their merry way. What she did not know about the centaur's blood, however, is that the Hydra's venom from the arrow was mixed in said blood. Later down the line, she thought Heracles found love in another woman, a woman called Iole. To ensure her husband's fidelity, she rubbed the inside of a robe with the centaur's blood and gifted it to Heracles. Once he unsuspectingly put on the robe, his skin burned with an unbearably excruciating pain. Not enough to kill him, but enough for him to want to be dead. He got a good friend of his, by the name Philoctetes, and had him build a funeral pyre, then cremate him. In a story finally coming full circle, once Heracles' mortal half was burned away on the pyre, Zeus sent Athena to take him to Olympus on her chariot. Heracles, now on Olympus, fully ascends to godhood, actually reconciles with Hera for good, and marries the Greek goddess of youth, Hebe. That is the tale of Heracles, from demigod to full-blown god. There are plenty more adventures from this point on that involve Heracles, like the Gigantomachy, for example. We'll explore that another time, though. I had a blast making this, and look forward to doing more like this. For now, however, I hope you have enjoyed this exploration and discussion of Heracles. If you did, leave me a like and tell me your thoughts in the comment section. Regardless, I appreciate your time above all else. Thank you for watching. Till next time, everybody. Peace.